All right, we are in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. <clears throat> if you remember last time, we closed with uh, their reading in John 19, verse 40. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. And so we finished up where we said that Jesus was crucified and he was put in the tomb. And there can be no doubt that he was really dead. I say that, you say, well, that's a strange thing to say, but I say that because there is a theory that was put forth that he didn't really die, he swooned and didn't really die on the cross. And you can read John's account and really there can be no mistaking the fact that he did indeed die. But there are those that put forth their ridiculous theories. There was a poor, poor, bewildered believer that wrote to a friend. He wrote, Dear Eucatus, our preacher said that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, be bewildered. Dear bewildered, beat your preacher with a multitude of heavy strokes using a whip that has glass and bone embedded in it. Nail him to a cross, hang him out in the sun for six hours, run a spear through his heart, embalm him, put him, in an, put him in an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. <laughs> Sincerely, Eutychus. Amazing what people will dream up when they're just not willing to accept that they needed someone to die for them. They needed Christ to die on the cross for them. Needed God to send a savior. That We all need a savior. Needed for Jesus to come and be that savior. See, people don't like to admit that because it means that they have to recognize that they have sinned. That there's sin in them and that they need a savior. It's not so much you see an intellectual thing. It's often just a condition of the heart. Men and women won't believe. Well, Jesus did truly die, and he died for the sins of the world. And so now we come to this wonderful chapter 20. We come to the resurrection, the chapter on the resurrection. Last time, we spoke of those who were standing at the foot of the cross. Today, I'd like to speak about three of those who stood looking into an empty tomb. I'd like us to see the different ways that those first visitors to the tomb processed what they saw. And perhaps we might see ourselves in one of them. Let's first consider the very first one to visit the tomb, Mary Magdalene. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 1. Now the first day of the week... Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. There are six Marys mentioned in the gospel and we tend to, we can get them a little mixed up from time to time, which Mary is which. Same as the Herods, there's a bunch of Herods and you can get your Herods mixed up and you can mix up your Marys, but there's no doubt here whatsoever who this Mary is, because John tells us very clearly that the one who went to the tomb first was Mary Magdalene. It says she went early, first day of the week. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early Sunday morning. That literally means between the time of the fourth watch, which was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., so it was really early. Actually, several women set off early from different parts of the city, as you learn by reading the accounts of the resurrection in 
the other three Gospels. But it seems that Mary ran on ahead of the rest of the women and went, who went early. The, she expected she wanted to be the first. She's very anxious to get there. Obviously, she was devoted to Jesus. Perhaps she could make an argument, say that she may have been a little more devoted than others. She was tremendously devoted to Jesus and ran on ahead. And as we look around, I think sometimes I, I have to marvel at the love and devotion of some of you. Sort of puts some of us to shame. And I do believe that there are some ahead of others. <laughs> and I'm sure you've seen people who you just say, wow. They have such devotion. They, they have such love for the Lord. Deeply devoted to the Lord. And we may say, well, they're a little ahead of us. And that was Mary. She was ahead of them. And I believe she was deeply devoted to Jesus. Now, of course, the reason the ladies were going to the tomb, they were going to take spices and further embalm the body of Jesus. Though it had already been wrapped and embalmed by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, it seems that these ladies wanted to take more spices, do some more work on the body. Mary, of course, still wanting to do something for Jesus. She was devoted, but you see, devotion leads to service. Devotion is not worth much if there's no service added to it. A devotion should lead to service. You see, we can all be spiritual and, uh, you know, worship and all the rest of it, but really it should lead us to serve the Lord. And although in her mind he is dead, she still wanted to do something for him. Now, why? Why was this woman so devoted? Why was this girl just desiring to go once again to do something for Jesus, although she thought he was dead? Well, as you look into the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 8 there, you see there, let's look at it for just a moment. I believe we have the answer as to why Mary was the way that she was. Let's look at it. Luke 8 verse 1. Came to pass afterward, that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. A certain woman who'd been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. So she had been possessed. She'd been demon possessed. And what a terrible thing that must have been. What a terrible thing it is to be demon-possessed. Now, tradition tells us, not so much the Bible, but tradition, there is the tradition that Mary was a bit of a scarlet woman. We're not sure, but the indication is that she lived an immoral life. Obviously, something wasn't right. She'd become the victim of Satan and was possessed. But Jesus had cast out these demons. See, she was in bondage to her flesh and the, and the devil, and Jesus delivered her. And to whom much has been forgiven, one who loves much, loves much in return. One who is loved, loves much in return. And she was loved so much. She experienced the love of Jesus, and so she loved back. She loved him back. There are many of you here, I'm sure. You know... The love of the Lord so much because he's done so much for you. You look back on your life and you sort of wonder where you would be. You ever do that? I've done that. I've done that quite a lot lately. <laughs> if things had turned out differently. Now I don't know if anybody here was ever demon possessed. But we were certainly in the grip of the devil in bondage to our flesh, in bondage to Satan, and Jesus has delivered you. 
Isn't that wonderful? He's delivered us. So when he has done so much for us, how can we do any other but want to do everything we can for him? Mary was so devoted that she stood with the rest of the women at the cross. It seems that she followed Joseph of Arimathea to see where they laid him and came to the tomb early. And she says she saw that the stone had been taken away. Now the women, talking among themselves as they were beginning to head off to, to the tomb, talking among themselves, how are we going to move the stone? Well, Mary didn't seem to be concerned. It's just, uh, just let's get there, you know, and we'll deal with that when we get there. Actually, the stone probably weighed about a ton and a half. You see, in front of the tombs there, they had sort of a, at the side of it, they had a groove in the ground where the stone would, uh, would roll in or move in. You can, you can actually see evidences or, or uh, examples of this in Israel. You can go to the garden tomb, for instance, in Israel, there in Jerusalem. Uh, the tomb that's believed by many to be the actual tomb that Jesus was laid in. And there's quite a lot of evidence that points towards it. Nobody knows for sure, of course. But there's a, they have a, quite a bit of evidence. And I think we have a picture there of the garden tomb. That's not it. That's not the garden tomb. It's the other picture. That's the garden tomb. And it is a wonderful place to visit. And there is, you kind of see in the ground there, there's a sort of groove on which the stone would, uh, would be moved. It's sort of like a big cartwheel, and like a big grinding stone, not like a big round boulder that you throw in front of it, but it would be like those huge grinding wheels, the millstones, the kind of thing that, like a big cartwheel, would, a big and uh, thick, huge stone and they had this groove that's probably slanted downward slightly and uh, the side of the rock and it would come over the hole and if you ever go you should go to see it better you go see it now you can show these other two uh, photographs see there's the big stone look you see that's the kind of stone it would be and there's the groove there that they roll it down and that's the kind of stone um, see the groove uh, that's the kind of stone it would have been. And he think, well, how could that stone be moved? Of course, they had no idea how they were going to move the stone. But when they got there, when she got there, the stone had already been moved. I want you to remember that the stone was not moved to get Jesus out. Uh, the stone was moved for the people to get in. He was already out. He's already risen. The angel moved the stone, but not for Jesus to get out, but for them to take a look in and see what had happened. So verse 2, John 20. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Mary thought that someone had come along, some grave robber, someone had come along and robbed the tomb of the body. So then we read verse 3. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and and the other disciple, this is John, of course, speaking of himself, outran Peter, came to the tomb first. Now, I don't know why, whether what, what John's saying here, whether he's boasting. Is he boasting? Uh, I, the other disciple came to the tomb first. You see, I, see, I can run faster than Peter. <laughs> I don't know why he put that in. Hey, maybe, you know, they, maybe they were a little competitive. But he wanted to know everybody, I can run faster than him. I got there first. Or it's just simple, that's, simply that's the fact. It, it's in there because that's what happened. And 
That's what I love about the Gospels. These little things that sort of have that note of realism. Yeah, I outran him. I got there first. The younger, John, runs faster than the older. So they ran together to the tomb. Something important to note here is that they knew where the tomb was. You say, why is that important? Well, it discredits another weak theory. Trying to disprove the resurrection. They come up with their theories. And one of the theories is that, well, the women, silly women, went to the wrong tomb. They went to somebody's tomb that had not been used yet, an empty tomb. And they went back, having gone to the wrong tomb. They had gone to the tomb that was empty. And they went back and told the disciples. Well, if that be the case, then Peter and John went to the wrong tomb. And the rest of the disciples, if they went to check it out, they went to the wrong tomb. The Jews, I'm sure they'd have gone and checked it out. They went to the wrong tomb. The Romans is sealed up the wrong tomb. The angels went to the wrong tomb. Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it was, went to the wrong tomb. Everybody went to the wrong tomb. Doesn't make any sense, does it? That kind of theory is easily disproved. They knew where the tomb was. And there was no mistake in the right tomb. So now let's consider how each of these three responded when they saw what they saw. Look at verse 1 again. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. The word for saw there. For Mary is the word blepo in the Greek. Simply means to see. She saw or to notice or to look. And now we come to verse 3, uh, sorry, verse 5, where we read of John. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, and yet he did not go in. Same word, blepo, it means to see. He just saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he didn't go in at this point. Now you get to verse 6. Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been round his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in place by itself. So Simon Peter came, probably puffing and panting a little bit, following John. But true to Peter's character, he went straight in and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around the head lying with the linen cloths but folded together, placed by itself. Well, the word for saw there is a different word. It's the word theoreo. It means to view attentively, to take view of, to survey or to carefully examine, to look with a critical eye and carefully examine. That's what that word theoreo means, saw. See, there are different words in the Greek language for different words. Like we have the word saw, that's it. There are different words that are interpreted in our Bible with that. So this is a different word. Verse 8, then the other disciple, John, who came to the tomb first, went in also. And he saw and believed. So he went in also, and he saw and believed. And the, where there, uh, the word there, a different word again for saw, is the word idol. It means to comprehend, to know, to get knowledge of, to understand, to perceive. So John saw, understood what he saw. And you see there's three different words there in the text for see or saw. And each one reflects the character of of those who stood at the tomb and what they saw. See, when they saw the linen cloths, actually they saw them wrapped like the body had just come out of them. Not like they were unwrapped or just thrown to one side. The clothes were there, it just, it just come out of the wrappings as it were. So much for the swoon theory. <laughs> even, or even the body that was stolen. That's another theory. Somebody came and stole the body, or the disciples stole the body. Well, they would, have, they would have had to taken the body still wrapped or unwrapped it, and the clothes would have just been there in a pile. 
Now, this is, there was something special about the way the clothes were laid. Something special that caused Peter to look at it and go, what's that? To examine it closely and, and go, well, this looks a little strange. This is strange looking. And for John to look and see, he looked and I do He understood what had happened. You see, the way, the way they saw it, there were three different ways uh, of what they saw inside the tomb. Three different ways that they comprehended what they saw. And, and you know, we're all like that. We really are. You can take a number of people and you can show them the very same thing and they can see it absolutely differently. See it in a totally different way. And that's what's so wonderful and unique about us all. So the three of them saw it differently. Mary just saw it. Perhaps she was so filled with grief she couldn't see anything other than the body was gone. She came to embalm him, to put more spices on him. she got a job to do. She's coming to do this job, and all she can see now is the body's gone. That's all she can think of right now. That's what's on her mind. She doesn't see anything else, but there's no body. The body's gone. You know, sometimes we cannot see the truth because we're so fixated on our present circumstances. We can't understand the wonder of it all. We have tunnel vision, as it were. She doesn't understand the wonder of it all. Not yet. She doesn't see and comprehend all that's before her. All she can see right now is the body's gone. Somebody took the body. And when we read through verses 11 through 15... And there, when you read about Mary, you can see that's what's on Mary's mind. You see, she stands outside weeping, looks into the tomb. There's, there's, there's beings there. They're angels, but I don't know what she, who she thinks of them. They make no impression on her. She probably thought they're just, they're just people or something, and I don't know what she thought. And they ask, why are you weeping? And she says, well, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. I, I don't know where they've, 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 they've taken him. She's just thinking the body's gone. Somebody took the body. Even when Jesus is there and appears to her and he says to her, woman, why are you weeping? She thinks he's the gardener. The furthest thing from her mind is that he's risen from the dead. He says, have you, have you taken him? Where have you taken him? Tell me where you've taken him and I'll, I, I, I'll go get him. I, I'll go pick him up. I don't know how she thought she was going to do that. I'll go get him. She's obsessed with getting the body of Jesus, doing whatever she was going to do to it. That's her mission. That's what's on her heart. You see, that's everything for her. She is devoted to the memory of Jesus. And the things that he said, the things that he'd done for her, they meant so much to her. It's not like when you see people that they've lost a loved one and they go to the tomb or go to the grave and they put their arms around the gravestone and they weep, you know, or they lay flowers there or whatever, just devoted to the memory of that person that they've lost. That's where Mary was at. He has so much more going on. <laughs> you see, Jesus is alive and she's going to have an experience with the living Christ. But you see, many are devoted to Jesus, as it were, as a hero or a great religious leader, the giver of truths, the teacher, the master, the one whose principles are to be followed, the one who is to be admired, the one who is to be loved in that sense, as it were, as you think of his life. But they don't know he's alive. The risen Christ wants to meet with us. He's not satisfied that we have sort of a sentimental relationship with him. That is what many people have. They have sort of a sentimental relationship with the dead Christ or the Christian religion, as it were, or the, or the teachings of Jesus. But he's alive, you see. 
And we're not to live either on yesterday's memories of him. But a day-to-day experience, everyday awareness of Jesus being alive. Every day we're to have that awareness of him. Now, how does Peter see it? Well, Peter came following John, went straight in like his nature is, went straight into the tomb and he saw Theoreo. Means that he examined the linen cloths lying there, but it doesn't say that he believed at this point. By evening he would. Actually, we know that Jesus met him privately. Met privately with Peter even before he appeared to the others on that evening. Luke 23 verse 34 says that. That he appeared to Simon. But at this point, no. He doesn't believe. He examined the linen cloths lying there. Took a good look at the grave cloths. Examined them. But he wasn't convinced at this point. And you see, that's how it is with many people. They examine Jesus. (coughs) but they don't believe. They hold back. They're either skeptical skeptical, or they're just like, I don't know about this resurrection stuff. And they say, well, I'm agnostic. They don't know. Famous agnostic, atheist, agnostic slash atheist, Bertram Russell, English philosopher, when he, asked, when he was asked, well, what will you do if when you die, you meet God? He says, well, I should say, God, you gave us insufficient evidence. But how wrong he was, wasn't he? How wrong he was. Seems he didn't examine the abundance of evidence available. But Peter looked on and examined, but he did not yet believe Not enough evidence yet for Peter. As those today perhaps think, well, there's not enough evidence. Or perhaps for Peter, there was another reason. Perhaps Peter didn't want to see Jesus right then. You see, Peter had failed Jesus, hadn't he? He failed him terribly. And the devil has a wicked way of keeping us from Jesus when we've failed. Satan keeps us from not wanting to fellowship with Jesus when we fail. We think that perhaps he won't accept us. We think that perhaps he, he, he won't listen to us or that he won't forgive us. And the devil would like to drive a wedge between us and Jesus. He'd like to drive us away from Jesus when we fail. But you see, the risen Lord has no wrath for Peter. Just love and forgiveness. And soon he would experience that. And even restoration. He would experience the love and the forgiveness that his Lord has for him. And has for us no matter what we've done. See it's the same for you and me. You don't have to just be, be, sort of stand back from all of this. You can get involved you see. You can believe. We can trust. We can have a relationship with the risen Christ because is there any of us who've done such a terrible thing as, uh, as Peter? Well, you think that was an awful, awful thing to do. Well, we've done terrible things even after we come to know the Lord. But you look back at what Peter did. He denied his Lord and yet there's forgiveness for him. And so surely there's forgiveness for us. And there's much more than just forgiveness. There's restoration restored even to the place where Peter will go on and be the first one to preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost. And have multitudes of people come to Jesus. Then we have John. Well, John saw. The word there is Ido. He saw and understood. He saw the clothes When he looked, it meant only one thing to him. Jesus is risen from the dead. He saw and he believed. Oh, for the simple faith to see and believe. For that simple faith. To be done with skepticism skepticism and unbelief, that's sin. 
And I do believe that the sin that it speaks of in the book of Hebrews where it tells us the sin that we so easily ensnares us is that sin of unbelief. We ought to be rid of that. Just to accept Jesus and accept what the Lord shows us. Uh, what we see. He says, uh, actually it says that he didn't understand it all. That is, he didn't understand everything when he saw it. He said, the other disciple, verse 8, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. Then verse 9, it says, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must, be, uh, must rise again from the dead. You see, he, he believed with the little understanding that he had. You don't have to understand everything to believe, to be saved, to have a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to have an understanding of all the scripture and everything all about it to have saving faith and believe and be born again. He saw and he believed. And often there are things that we don't understand. It's sort of like we can't yet put them all together. But we can have faith to believe the things and comprehend the things that he's shown us. Even if it's not very much. So you can still be saved by putting faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Young believer. Baby Christian. Don't think you have to know it all before you can have a wonderful relationship with Jesus. One verse is enough. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that the only verse you have? It's enough. The whole gospel is in that one verse. The glorious 316 of John. You hear that and believe. So all three of them saw the same thing. But each one of them saw it differently. Here's Mary. Perhaps blinded by her loss. Consumed with the memory of Jesus. Wanting to preserve that that she had. That what she got left of Jesus she wanted to preserve. She's unable at this point to comprehend the truth of it all. I wonder if there's any Marys here. Jesus is sort of just a distant memory, uh, trying to preserve what you've left of, got left of him. But he wants you to have that living, vital relationship with him today. Then there's dear Peter. So careful to examine what is saw, and yet his heart is not yet ready to believe. Are there any skeptics here today? Or perhaps, as we said, it was his failure that got in the way. Do we have any Peters here today? You failed the Lord, and that's standing in the way of you seeing the risen Christ and having that wonderful relationship with him. Well, there's forgiveness, there's restoration. Then there's dear John. John the Beloved. He saw and he believed. And I trust that there are many of them like John here today. You saw and you believed. You had a simple faith just to trust in Jesus and believe. And I'm coming to understand more and more, even since my recent visit to the UK, I'm coming to understand more and more that there are people that don't yet know or understand or see. All they need to be, is be told. There's no comprehension of it. And yet, they would have that simple faith and trust and believe if they just could see. If someone would just tell them and someone would just show them that Christ is alive and he rose from the dead. I do believe, brothers and sisters, you have family, you have friends, you have folks in the community. All they need to be done is just told them. Oh, I know there are those that, you know, no matter what you say, they don't want to believe. But I believe there are those who are just waiting to hear Wait for someone like you, like me, to tell them of the love of Christ. I do believe that. 
And so we ought to do that today. We should take the good news of the risen Christ. Those of us that have looked and idol, saw, and understood, and believed. Isn't that glorious? Father, thank you for your word. And as we see the, these examples today of real people in a real situation and may have comprehended things a little differently at the first, but we know each one of them came to know you and understand the risen Christ and met the risen Christ. Do pray, Lord, for all, even in this room today, that we might come to that true comprehension of understanding and knowing that Jesus is alive and that we might know him for ourselves. So bless each of my brothers and sisters here today and everyone watching online. Bless each one with the, the knowledge of this truth in Jesus' name. Amen.